So I haven't got an intro for this show because you are, in fact, the first guest that we've had on. So usually with my hacked off stuff, I've got like a pre-prepared intro. But I think for this one, we should just go into it. So. Yeah, I agree. So we're talking about cybersecurity certifications because I did a video about certifications uh, where I was just speaking on my own. And the point that I wanted to get across in the original video that I did was there's a lot of different reasons to get cybersecurity certifications other than just your, your boss told you to. And it and it sounds like, Sawan, you've got uh, some similar opinions, maybe some different ones in some areas. So I guess let's open the, the floor with the first question of why do you think people should get certifications, professional certifications? Hi, Holly. I think um, the biggest the biggest reason, the most the strongest reason is what's it going to do for you? What's in it for me is what people should be asking themselves. And they should think about, is it really going to help me? And does it have a chance of helping me? And what's the investment from doing so going to give me in return? And try to gap assess themselves and where they're going in life with it that way. Yeah, I think the, the big thing for that, when people think of what is it going to do for me? What what do I get in return? Um <sighs> For, for me, sometimes I do a lot of uh, certifications for just personal reasons because of the the confidence boost that it gives. And it's not necessarily um, tied to a specific career goal. It's just this is something that I've been learning and I want, you know, to be able to write down I've achieved a certain level of that learning. Yeah, I totally agree with that. That's actually, um, that was how it all started for me, actually, uh, many years ago. When I would very, I was very technology focused mm-hmm. earlier in my career. Whenever there was the technology, whether you know, as a work initiative or something that we're implementing, I would think to myself, ah, is there a badge for this? I want to go and get this. I, I, we've delivered a great project and initiative. The, the business is happy. I want the badge to, to also show that I, I'm, I'm good at this. I'm the master of this. You know? So I would look for something. And I, I went through a lot of Microsoft certifications at that time. Yeah, that's a funny thing as well, where um, different certification boards have a different approach to things. So my early um, career certifications were all Cisco based. And then these days, it's more CompTIA and and Crest and more Pentest focused. But you do see a different approach that certification bodies have. And I think one of the biggest differences that I see between certification bodies is um, how recertifying works. So you you attain a certification, then um, recertifying can be uh, different in some instances. Now, one of the things that I've been told repeatedly this week is you shouldn't bother recertifying. Once you've achieved a level and it goes on your CV, if it expires, just write on your your CV or your resume that it is expired. How do you feel about that? Do you retain certifications or do you let them expire? Definitely a fan of uh, and a believer in retaining certifications. Now, I understand it's you know there's a there's a lot to it in the sense that retaining certifications, especially with most of the organisations that uh, have a policy to continuously uh, collect professional points, development points to retain your certifications. There's a cost, there's fees, there's annual memberships to being able to do so, or there's the traditional way of just going sit the exam again when it comes to expiry, pay the fee and do it. But the biggest benefit is to show your continued relevance in the room on the subject matter because you're always showing that you're current in what's changing. These certifications expire for a reason because their they're, they're content changes. And, um, you know, I, I sat a CCNA, it was in, um, it was my first Cisco, first and only Cisco qualification mm-hmm. I did, that was in 2004. I couldn't say that I'm Cisco qualified now and expired because that's extremely outdated, you know, it's a long time ago and all that stuff's changed. So the right thing is to think about how can you balance it? This costs, yes, but that's when we should be approaching our businesses who often hire us, our employers hire us because they see your CV, they see you've got this experience, they see you've got certain badges, you have a great conversation, you get offered a job and you, you get hired. But they've hired you based on that experience, which what was on your CV is also part of that content. So don't you, don't, So I believe it's part of their responsibility also to acknowledge and support you when you go to them and say, right, I need to, I need, uh, to be able to expand or have investment from you to maintain my certifications in the renewal costs and the membership costs necessary for this. A lot of organizations will back you, but it's about how you ask and making sure that it's in their benefit as well as yours, because they are also then retaining staff with active qualifications. Yeah, I think um, when when people see... So most certifications that I come across um, expire after about three years. And I think most people think, you know, 
well, after three years, you're probably still in the same role. You probably remember all of the same things. You know, if you've done a Cisco certification, CCNA, something like that, you're probably still doing network engineering. But there is a certain point in which that might not be true anymore. You know, I am not a network engineer anymore. I'm a pen tester. I don't work daily on Cisco hardware. It is fair that I would have to actively keep up those skills. So by making you recertified, that is one way of just ensuring that you demonstrate you've kept up with it. Yes, and keep your form right as well, isn't it? Because, you know, you learn by the book a particular way. And there's a a reason that saying is there, right? Do things by the book, Mm. learn by the book. Because self-taught sometimes has a risk, an adverse risk, which is that it may not always be organized. How many times have we come across fellow colleagues out there who've got it all in their head, but it's not written down anywhere, or they don't follow a specific methodological approach to deliver something, implement something, set something up. So when you go into these highly regulated environments uh, to work, like an airport or somewhere like that, you know it's important to make sure that you follow a, a you know a method to do it. Keep your form right to implement things and do things. And it's these certifications that are going by the book that keep you on that track. And to just no longer do it and leave it from years ago, it is there's no doubt one's form can get rusty. Yeah, I like the point there as well about um, independent learning because pretty much all of the um, certifications that I have gained have been through independent learning. So typically, uh, I might be um, working in the field, but what I mean by independent learning is I'm not sitting a course to get that certification. I'm just uh, either working or self-studying and then um, sitting the exam. And for me, the, the reason that I still like doing that, even if I'm just trying to get the skill is because it it demonstrates that I've covered everything. So the example that we spoke about earlier was um, I recently did the AWS machine learning specialty. Now I work on machine learning and we've been doing a lot of research in that area, but for anyone who who works in certain areas, you know, we focus on a a niche. We don't necessarily focus on the, the, the broad side of machine learning. So by doing the certification, it makes sure that I haven't missed anything. And it also makes sure that it can demonstrate to people that, hey, I have been doing this work if it doesn't necessarily um, feature prominently on my CV, especially when, you know, people tend to put me in the pen test bucket. They don't necessarily expect me to have machine learning experience. So, um, yeah, I like grabbing the certification because it just makes sure that, as you said, there's there's like a structure to that learning and, and I haven't missed any major area. I agree with that completely. You know, we're all in the driving seat of our own career. And I think as long as everybody realizes that and thinks and always thinks that first, then they'll be able to make the decisions that matter most. I, by the way, am the same as you. Um, The majority of the certifications that I have sat my entire career have been self-invested. There has been open opportunity, and that's due to experience that I've been able to then get and ask for investment on, uh, you know, things like what we mentioned, the the uh, memberships mm-hmm. or renewal and things like that. But initially, the decision to go out and get a very expensive badge has been on me. And it's also been the self-applied um, you know, uh, realization of the pressure to make sure that I get the return on investment for those things. And that's why it's important to plan. And I think when we go back to think about what you want, where you want to go, which badge could really help you, and then think about how much that costs and ongoing maintenance fees helps people. But yes, I am the same. I've done it because I want to keep learning and um, I've paid for most of mine. And I've not always got my money back from employers, very rarely. That's that's a fact, but it's helping me and it's helped me in the market. So um, we talked about how we both have had the approach of doing independent learning and then taking the exam. But how do you recertify? Do you collect the the professional points? I know each certification body has a different name for what those points are, but I think professional points, everybody knows what we're talking about there. Um, Do you collect the points and recertify that way or do you reset the exam? So um, thankfully with some of the, um, well, most of the cybersecurity ones, the point system is there. And I'm, I am very relieved by that because I really don't want to, of course, you know, exams are always full of fresh. I remember sitting my CISM, my CISSP, CIPP and TOGAF. I mentioned the four because they personally are very close to me, to my heart. I really uh, like those four. Um, they were so tough. I think I got most of my gray hair studying for those. <laughs> <laughs> now those ones, yeah, but they, as well as the Comte tier one I have, they're, they're all, they're all, um, they will have an option to pay a fee each year and um, collect points, activities, do things on the in the industry, 
contribute and grow the profession by doing and participating in many things, whether that's writing articles, whether that's panel discussions, whether that's public speaking keynote, or whether it's just, you know, um, teaching in your organization, okay. having a bunch of people running an awareness campaign, a responsibility on most information security professionals to just gather gather people in a room and, and, and or in a virtual session and, and give them some cyber awareness training. You mark that, you log it, you document it, you provide evidence and upload it. All of these things, you know, they all uh, they can all help. I do that, and in return, it makes me better and keeps me keeps me practicing my profession. So my preference is to do it this way. Not all not all exams are going to allow me to do so. For example, uh, AWS, Amazon AWS. I I have one qualification there. It's a Solution Architect Associate, and I have to sit a renewal exam next month. I just wish they did the point system too, but no. But I'm I'm going to follow your footsteps and try and achieve your try and achieve the one you have. I'm going to try and work for that one if I can pull it off. Oh, the machine learning specialty. That is a good exam. We should we should give some of the details of that in a second because I I did very much enjoy that journey. But it's um it's funny for you to give um such a good overview of the benefits of those point systems and how they can benefit you in other ways other than just recertifying. Because I have never done that. I only reset the exams now. Um, I should I should try and tell you how, how I justify that. Um, the reason is I've done it once. I know what I'm in for and I don't need to track my uh, activities. And I, I definitely do enough. I definitely deliver enough training, let alone um, sit on training courses and do webinars and things like that. Um, I definitely could do that. But, but for me, um, it pretty much allows me to forget about it until the three years are about up. And like you, I kind of get an eye on these things, maybe six weeks or, or four weeks out. Um, and then I know what the exam is going to be like. I know what the content is going to be like. Yes, it generally has been updated, but it's not a significant overhaul in most instances. It's just adding a module and dropping a module. Um, so I have only ever resat the exam. And I think that the big justification for that from my point of view is I am lucky that I don't get exam anxiety. The uh, sitting in an exam hall for three hours, as the the machine learning one was, um, that that doesn't bother me. Um, it doesn't mean I don't get nervous. It doesn't mean I don't have to really put effort in to make sure that I pass the thing. But I think some people get a layer on top of that, just being nervous of the content and anxiety about the environment and anxiety about delivering the exam. And I'm lucky I don't get that. So my preference is don't think about it for three years. Go and reset the exam. <laughs> No, I agree. I, I agree. I get that completely. And I think, you know, some of the things that, and that's right, you know, there isn't any particular approach. If some people have, uh, uh, can do it that way as well, then that's an absolutely solid way to do it, without a doubt, especially if they feel that they're on top of it. And they've done the research to know that there's only been two modules that have changed. I just have to do two months worth of study. I know I can fit it in. And, and yeah, that's, you know, it's a good way to do it. And And if their life hasn't managed to help them you know, contribute to earning points and stuff like that in that whole year. It really does help. But you know, one one example I wanted to give mm -hmm. with how things again help people's careers, however they do it, is is that, you know, there was a time when I got into this my first few exams that are renewable certifications mm -hmm. via the point I made the decision I'm going to go and try and do it that way. But it's but I'm going to do it that way because it's going to help me do what I should be doing, what I felt I should be doing to grow my presence in the industry. And, you know, there was a year I use this as a benchmark one. It's an old story now, but I use this as a benchmark one because I was once at um, the Queen Elizabeth Center in London in the crowd mm -hmm. watching a whole bunch of smart people talking on stage at Data Protection World and really enjoyed that. Loved it. Great, you know, InfoSec and privacy session. The following year, after 12 months of me contributing, I had uh, I had achieved my um, CISM with ISACA. I had started doing a lot of this online stuff, this this participation, you know, talking, panel discussions, all sorts of stuff. And, you know, putting my own content out there occasionally on LinkedIn, this type of thing. The following year, I was invited to go and talk on stage at, at the same privacy event. And it happened because of that reason, because of, 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 you know, putting the effort in, contributing to the industry, making a difference, people getting to know who you are, and then all of a sudden I was there and I thought to myself, this is an interesting story. I was once in the crowd. I really was looked at everybody with thinking, wow, amazing. And now I'm doing it too. And that's great. And it's only happened for that reason. And at the same time, it's been because I've been renewing my qualifications and also contributing to make a difference in the industry. And I'm actually better at what I do. 
above everything. I'm better at what I do because I've been talking about this constantly. I'm talking about it on stage, you know. And you know, you do this all the time, mm -hmm. the public speaking. And you know how that how that really helps others and you to keep on point with everything, right? One of the things I think from public speaking is um, very often people don't realize that you know, speakers can inspire each other to do um, further talks. I have um, delivered talks following on from other people's research where they've um, maybe got so far with an idea and then they've stopped because they've run out of time or sometimes the deadline for the talk has come up and that has given me ideas to go away and do further research or to apply that research into a, a different area. Um, so, so that happens where, yeah, genuinely you can watch somebody talk and then put something together yourself. Or also just one of the things to bear in mind is like the public speaking side of things becomes much easier the more um, sure you are in your ability, your knowledge of that area. So again, certifications are going to help you with things like public speaking because it gives you that confidence boost. You know, if you're talking about something that that is relatively new to you, it's going to be a lot better if you have done an exam that gives you that, you know, assurance that, yes, I know what I'm talking about and I can speak authoritatively on, on this topic. I've got a question though. Um, so we talked about uh, recertifying and it sounds like your approach is a little bit different to mine. So I'm curious about um, how do you actually study for these certifications? Are you the kind of person who draws a schedule and you do a little bit over a long period of time? Are you an exam crammer? How do you, how do you approach the actual exam day? Great question. One thing I've, I've never been a fan of is the exam cramming thing. Now, I, I do I do appreciate that it probably works. No, it does work. Of course, it exists for that reason. I know people who do that and, you know, they'll spend a lot of time focusing on practice questions. And, and if it's great, if it works for them, it, it's great. But the thing is, I find that um, when I thought about what that is and how that works and, and, and you know, looking at vendors that sell these kind of things, uh, I thought to myself, it takes away the enjoyment of studying as well for me. And to me, I thought I need to, I want to learn this stuff. I want to be able to understand it and articulate it in many conversations and pull back and pull deep into this content and make it real. Um, I have always focused on picking minimal materials. So there'll be, for example, one video course could be one. I'll choose just one from whoever that I think is a good, good balanced one with the right amount of hours and you know, less whiteboard ex, ex, over caffeinated type session, more <laughs> just on well explained, ex, well experienced kind of individual. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll dig into the resource like somebody on LinkedIn learning or Udemy. These are a couple of my favorites, but there's no, it could be anything, you know, there's been very different individuals who've done different courses and I've just picked them because I've loved the way they speak and the way they explain things. I'll pick one video course and I'll pick the book, a book. Um, it often won't be the um, official guide because they're often very long. Mm -hmm. It'll be a good third party guide. And I will master by repetition. As one of the instructors on a course I was once on said to me, master by repetition, by repeating, repeating and repeating. Now there's one very specific thing which I have added and I've learned to add to my routine, which really, really works. And I proved it when preparing for my, uh, proved it to myself when preparing for my CISSP, and that was cognitive music, cognitive enhancing music. So for me, and it, for everybody will be different, right? For me, it's it's very, it's a kind of very, very uh, specific, calm house type music that I play at a certain level and would also listen at a certain level, the audio course that I'm that I'm going through. So they're both playing at the same time and just get into the zone with this stuff and it works. And then I would also read, whatever I'm reading to master by repetition is with that music still playing in my mind. It's blocking out all the sound. I can't hear my kids. I can't hear anybody. I might be in the room with them, but I can't hear them. So they're looking at me and they're talking at me. I'm just gonna look at them blankly because my mind is with this music and, and it's gone with me, you know? The music really, really helps, but it's just music with, salt, with, with lots of wording because that takes your focus away. It's just music with, that's just, you know, for me, it's cognitive house music. You know, it's, it's fantastic. That's, uh, that's a funny thing, actually, because uh, you, you gave some of the answer I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting the music thing. But I have had similar experience. So I'll get to that in a second. But first, I do need to admit, um, I am an exam crammer. Um, I don't do anything different, really, to what, to what you've described there. Um, but for example, when I get the study book, I will aim to read that 300 page book in like 12 hours and I will sit down and I will read that book. And um, there's a few different reasons for it. One of the things is, 
you know what, cramming does help you pass exams. And I know people can can listen to this and say, but it doesn't help you understand the content. Uh, yeah, I can see that point immediately, but it will help me pass the exam. And that is one of the things that we're talking about here. So I, I do cram an awful lot. I will typically go over that book again at a slower pace, but just before the, the exam, a couple of days before, I'll, I'll aim to get through the whole thing as a last minute exam cram, uh, cram session. And I, and I do take that quite extreme as well. I will do like 10 or 12 hour session the, the day before an exam. Um, but I also do the music thing. So you mentioned um, cognitive house music. Uh, Lo-fi is, is what I go for, but it's, it's the same general idea. It isn't necessarily for me the lack of lyrics, but I do hear that from a lot of people picking a genre where it's the, the sound to block out distractions. I hear that from a lot of people. Um, for me, I could have just one headphone in. I don't necessarily need to block out all sound. Um, and I can also do it with things like uh, watching vlogs. So so watching um, videos online of vlogs. What I'm basically looking for is um, content where I know what the arc is going to be and it's not going to distract me. It's not going to pull me in. Um, but lo-fi music is, is my, my best one for that where... It just consumes the part of my brain that wants to be distracted and it just consumes the part of my brain that wants to see, oh, what's happening on Twitter or what's happening on um, LinkedIn. And it, it allows the distraction part of my brain to be to be focused on the music whilst I am probably cramming uh, the content in, in the book or the, the video series. Nice. That sounds good. And, and, you know, let's go into cramming for a minute, mm -hmm. if we could. Uh, just to define the difference here, you know, because I, when, when you asked me, I referred to the differences as, you know, I referred to cramming that potentially meant practice questions, practice questions, and more practice questions. Yeah. But I think you're not saying that. You're saying you'll, you, you're, you'll go through the books, you'll read the books, and you'll go through it, and you'll put lots of hours and prep into so, it. So what I'm, what I'm talking about, like the difference for me is, um, you know, uh, one group of people might do something like an hour a day or a couple of hours every couple of days and have a schedule for learning where you almost block out, right, week one, I'm doing module one, week two, I'm doing module two. And that's like a very organized, longer term learning strategy. Whereas cramming for me is a very short term, intense strategy. So I'm not necessarily talking about practice questions that they, they sometimes do form part of it. Uh, I'm not a big practice question person. But yeah, for me, it, it's the difference between an hour a day or the day before the exam, I will do 12 hours of reading this book. Okay, yeah, and I think I've noticed that from you. You're a very, very strong reader. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I need to, that's an area I need to develop in, actually. You know, I want to read more. I want to just read more in general, mm. you know. And, I read. Uh, even stuff on our industry. I read an awful you know? lot and I read quickly. And I think some people presume that that's just like a skill that you're born with. And it, it's not at all. I, I can read quickly because I read a lot. Um, that's not presuming, you know, uh, people have issues that impact their, their reading skills like dyslexia and things like that. But if you if you don't have a condition like that to compete with, um, I find that the more longer form that I read, the, the easier it is that I get to hold my attention. And I find that social media in particular, uh, microblogging sites or things like Twitter um, can break your ability to sit down and read a chapter of a book because you want everything in 280 characters. So I have to balance that that kind of um, input somewhat. But yeah, for me, reading, it's like public speaking. It's a practice skill. Why can I sit down and, and read a book in one go? It, it's because because I do that and it's it's something that um, I keep up. Yeah, people, I think I think in our in our modern world, people are more reliant on video training than, than reading. And it's easy to just pick that route. But it actually, as well as you can you can succeed that way, it actually, um, you know, it, it 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 disadvantages you to not do at least both. I think you know it's a. I think that's that's a that's a key thing. The advantages of reading and learning, and how it also enhances the way you even you know talk and speak about things. That comes from reading more than watching videos. I think, but uh, a good blend is always good in, in both cases. I would concede that a good blend is probably the right thing to do. And I would also say for almost every exam, even a recertification, I will probably try and find a good video series. Um, I do struggle, though. This is this is the funny thing. I, I'll sit down and read a book um, end to end, but I would struggle to uh, to cover a video series in long form. I, I know what the, the solution to that is probably going to be. It's, well, don't sit down and try and watch six hours of training videos, you know, do do a small piece every day. And I imagine that works. But as, as people can hear from the fact that I do cramming sessions, it, it doesn't work for me. I really, really struggle to get through a video series. And, and I would um, 
pick very specific parts of those video series. Very rare for me to get all the way through on. Yeah, I think so. I think it really comes down to what we say in, in our challenge in our industries when we're talking to people in our workplace and things like that. If we don't come across really well and speak clearly and concisely, um, we could lose our main stakeholders' interest within minutes. You know, they say the CFO and the CEO, they, they leave the room within one minute if you're not interesting, if, if what you're saying is not interesting yeah. to them. It's the reality of our corporate world, isn't it, right? So then they're humans and so are we. So when we're sitting here listening to something, a course, and we want to learn something, we've obviously got an agenda, we want to learn that stuff. And if it's not interesting and not coming across well, or it's just way too much talk, is as a as an eight-hour course turned into thirty-two hours, you know, in modules, it just 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 loses your interest, doesn't it? So it's just about finding the right one. It is hard to find them, and then also to have the balance to find one that's short enough that covers what you need. So do you it's hard. do you ever listen to videos or um, other audio content at speeds faster than one times? No, that's something I've not done. I've heard some things about that. I, Tell me. <laughs> I, I do some some extreme things. So um, one of the things that I've done previously, which which uh, does work, but this is where you're getting to the really ridiculous end of cramming. Um, I will listen to an audiobook at the same time as reading the book, but I will listen to the audiobook at a very high pace, so like 1.5 times, 2 times, something like that. Um, that is if you really need to get through some content and you've only got a couple of hours. Um, but no, as a general rule, if I'm listening to to any content, it's unlikely that I would have it at one times. Um, even a, even you know just an audiobook, I, I read a lot of read a lot, listen to a lot of um, audiobooks, and even then they're probably 1.1, 1.2 times. See now, this is the thing. Uh, when a few moments ago you reminded me of something, and you did just now again, continuous improvement, right? That's what we're heavily invested in. So that angle of continuous improvement, which I think everybody should be, especially if they want to be in this industry, they are adapting and evolving as time goes on and their style of learning. So when I said that in my during my uh, CISSP preparation, I discovered for me the whole angle of the um, the music, you know, the house music. Yeah. And I, I balance the volumes on two internet tabs if I'm listening to something or I have it playing with the right volume and if I can't hear anything else and I'm reading. Whatever I'm doing, that was new for me. And, and I've never looked back since. It worked. I measured it in the whole week. I assessed my capability at the beginning and at the end. So, and of course, ultimately by passing. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, that's evolved and that was new. And, you know, and I think now when I think about that, playing things at faster speeds is probably another evolutionary step in that because we've got to keep on evolving our ability to learn, to find ways to do it better. And I think what you're doing there is, is, is probably another angle of, that I need to experiment with. Yeah, I think... It's going to help me learn better. I definitely will do it. I'll try that. I will. <laughs> I think that the big thing here is, you know, it's different methods for different types of learning. It depends what, what you're doing. Um, you know, uh, I, I do use repetition within study. In particular, if I'm trying to remember acronyms, where I am effectively just trying to memorize something, these letters in this order mean this these words. Um, so use repetition for, for things like that. I know people use um, things like flashcards for a similar reason, where you're, you're looking at learning, um, you know, very specific facts. Uh, I don't typically use flashcards. I did for my machine learning certification, because uh, one of the things that is in that certification is memorizing equations. There's about 15 relatively simple, but 15 of them equations for sum of square errors, mean square errors, those kinds of things. Um, so I did use uh, flashcards for those, mainly because whilst we use those techniques within you know the machine learning work that we do, we don't use them all. And of course, I don't know which one is going to appear on the exam. So um, you know, memorizing individual facts, memorizing acronyms, memorizing uh, uh, graphics or diagrams or equations, those kinds of things, then yeah, repetition and, and flashcards is what works there. When I'm just trying to get an overview of, of what is a specific area or something like that, then um, audio content played very quickly is, is how I would do that. Yeah, I understand. And you know, I also must say, as much as you and I have a good success story with, with how we've achieved the ones we do mm -hmm. and we are passing the we have a good list of them and we do we're doing well in our careers as much as that's all happening there are those challenges because we're human too right and I'm, I'm going to talk about myself and say look I am also um, aware of the distractions that come with with 
with technology and stuff like that. So, for example, I would rather not use my laptop to study something oh. that will convince me to click on a few tabs and quickly check my email and, and then look at something else that I want to look through. You know, yeah. I, I try my best not to because I know that'll disadvantage me at the beginning. Why is that? Because I no longer tempted to because I'm human too, right? This <laughs> so. is this is something that I do and would never have thought to bring up. Um, I have on my desk right next to me, I use a iPad Pro for study. Um, I use it for any task that I don't want to be distracted from. So if I'm studying for certifications, if I'm studying uh, exams, or also if I am taking notes in a meeting where I, I need to not open that tab and start reading about this other unrelated content, uh, or put, put a YouTube video on or something like that, um, then I do that. Now, um, tablets like the iPad, you, you can do multitasking on. In fact, um, I use an app called GoodNotes, and I'll use the split screen view so I can have the textbook open and my uh, notebook open, and I can read the textbook and take notes in line as I go, and that works really well. Um, but I just, in that environment, in the iPadOS environment, don't find myself playing a YouTube video on one side and trying to study on the other. Um, so, so I don't get those distractions in that way. But yeah, absolutely right. Like you said, if I am studying, I will purposely not use my laptop because I know that I'm going to open messaging apps and open social media and open YouTube and all of those things. Yeah, I'm the same. Absolutely. I, I even went to the extreme of uh, not not trusting myself with an iPad initially. Yeah. I've come back down that road because I think that GoodNotes is fantastic, uh, especially when you use a, a paper-like screen mm -hmm. protector yep. so the school on it becomes even more natural. And you do those small investments and tweaks, you really feel it, it helps you learn, it helps you focus and, and, and makes it so enjoyable to draw everything out that's in your mind that you're listening to, right? But... Prior to that, I tried something called a Remarkable tablet, which was just a big e-ink tablet because yep. I didn't want internet in any shape or form. I didn't want the ability to step away. I wanted to leave my phone in another room and go in another room because yep. the stakes were high because we talked about investment, right? I was paying for these exams myself. And I thought, you know what? If I fail, I have to pay again. So I've got to. And I, I, I put that extreme angle on it. And it worked for me. It worked. I passed. But the reality is I also, at the end of the journey, realized that you know, I I could I don't need to be I don't need this anymore. I got rid of this device and I, I moved on to the iPad route and you know embraced good notes and and wow that's a really good learning yeah, tool. Yeah, I think and there's a lot of I think that's a, a good point as well because like we could go into a, a whole tangent about like uh, what is the best app for that kind of thing. I do use Good Notes. Um, you could you could go into a whole route about what is the best device because the Remarkable versus the iPad is a really good discussion to have. And depending on specifically what you're looking for, you'll get um, different benefits out of each device. Um, and then just like little tips, like I used to, my, my last iPad, um, I did the paper-like surface on the screen and found that was a great improvement. And then on the, uh, on the iPad I've got now with the iPad Pro, um, I haven't done that and I don't feel like I need it, knowing the difference between the thing. So I guess this generation probably just has a very slightly different um, glass on the screen. I don't actually know, but I find this time I, I haven't needed it. And then things like, you know, the difference between um, a big iPad where you can split screen between a book and your notepad, that's good. But you can also split screen between a YouTube video and your notepad and maybe that's bad. So maybe a smaller, like an iPad mini or something uh, or a smaller tablet is is the way to go. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to, to bring up, not to go down that massive route of, of uh, the device wars is what other resources would you recommend? So I absolutely would recommend people make a decision on what location are you studying in? I don't study on the desk that I work on. I'm lucky enough that I can have a separate study space and I don't study on my laptop. I study purposely on the iPad. Um, what are the resources be it websites, blogs, podcasts, what have you, resources generically, would you recommend? I think um, it's a good broad one there. To start with, uh, I agree with the uh, moving around is good. Moving around, changing your environment, even going to coffee shops is good, you know, for a small duration and, and move move around. That's, that's definitely a good idea because you're increasing your blood flow in between your day. You're not getting into any specific balanced level that's going to slow you down. And you keep your cognitive function strong and absorbing content. It's that triggering that theta mode. I think that's great. As far as material goes, when you're picking an exam, I believe to keep it minimal. Don't collect too many video courses. Don't collect too many books. It's a very default thing to do. I'll, I'm going to prepare for this. I'm going to collect as much as possible. I'll buy as much as possible. Do a bit of this, do a bit of that. Never finish anything. Definitely don't do that. 
take a very short amount of time and pick your material and then plan how you're going to execute that material. And that's about making a strategic plan. Literally, think of your study plan as a strategic plan with a tactical plan and short-term plan. So we're really talking about your long-term goal. When do you want what? And how are you going to achieve that with mid-term goals followed by short-term goals? If you map it out like that and you see the shorter ones feed into the midterm and the midterm feed into the long, you achieve them all, you achieve everything, you measure them, you constantly gap assess them, then you know, is it working? Am I achieving? Am I passing? Am I, am I doing better on questions at the end of each chapter? You know, am I where I want to be? Is things working out for me at work? Are we delivering that? All of these things help with the whole broad picture of a tool belt. And this thing I'm talking about, the the planning it out with long-term, mid-term and short-term goals. I've put together my world of experience into a book, which is up for pre-order pre on Amazon. Um, I'll uh, post a link to the comments. It's the InfoSec Career Resilience Guide by myself. I'll put a link to that in the comments and uh, time will be, it's, it's a good read. It's a short read. I haven't made it long because as we talked about earlier, it's not about making things very long. It's about straight to the point, something you can use straight away. It's worked for me. And if I could say, in my entire career today, I have built my success based on knowledge, confidence, and articulation, communicating clearly and concisely, but measuring it to it to make sure it's always relevant all the way through. And I've tried to put that into this short book, which uh, hopefully you'll find useful. It's a one-time read. If you feel that you could do with a structure to organize how you're going to get from where you want to be, where you are to where you want to be in your learning goals, then this book can help. We are we are such different studiers. This is this is uh, surprising to me. Um, I I don't make a study plan at all. But I think one of the benefits of of books like uh, yours is the fact that it will give you ideas. As we're talking through this video, you know, we're talking about oh, have you tried studying with music? Have you tried you know uh, using repetition? Have you tried using flashcards? I think um, it's quite likely uh, that different people will learn in different ways, and they'll and some things will work for them, and others won't. And a big part of it is just you know, trying different things and working out what works for you. Um, so, yeah, I think that that would be the benefit of, of something like um, a structured plan would be being able to, as you say, measure the impact of some of the things that you do. Um, because if you're trying something and it's not working, you should try something else. That's, that's the easy guidance, right? Absolutely, yeah. That's the key thing. It's when you know it's working out or not, right? Or whether you need to make a change. Definitely. So... Um, I think that the, the big thing to finish up on then would be thinking about somebody's journey from uh, breaking into cybersecurity or, or coming into uh, a technical career, because I know a lot of people don't necessarily come straight into cyber, but might work in IT for a while, might work as a software dev for a while, uh, and then come into the industry. But um, how do you feel about the certification structures in terms of things like um, CompTIA, for example, where they have beginner level, intermediate level, expert level. Uh, would you say follow a structure like that or are you more kind of pick and choose specific certifications depending on where you currently are from different bodies? I, sh I think my answer is going to be um, a little bit both, uh, both in a sense, and it depends, and I'll explain why. The you know that you really want to be, you, you love networking and you want to go down the whole entire networking track and you know that the world relies on networks and you just want to go right to the top in that. It really excites you. Then there's no doubt about it. Going into the Cisco track, starting off from a CCNA, working your way up and eventually the, the, the gold CCIE, for example, that kind of thing, it makes a lot of sense. Your new certifications renew the previous ones and you keep on uh, passing and learning and you become the best at what you do. Um, but if you are evolving your career and changing it, and it's, you know, it's, and you're not, and you, and you, you could have changes which way you go, but it could also be that you're adapting it to a broader environment. Let's say, for example, IT management, for example. So I came from a technological uh, background, broad IT management before I went and specialized in InfoSec privacy. Now, in that time, I needed a broad skill set. I renewed my MCSE three times, Microsoft's gold standard at the time. I then realized, okay, you know, I need to be, I want to get more organized. I'm going to prove I can be a business leader. So I, I, I studied a bunch of project management stuff, Prince2, Agile, PM, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, that enhanced me. It helped. Now, there's a broad batch there. So it's realities. You've got to think about what's the tool belt I need to succeed in what I'm doing? What are my weaknesses? So it comes back to gap assessment again. 
where do you feel you're strong, where do you feel you're not, and look for the right thing to help you there. And uh, well, again, and look at what happened there. I then changed, right? I've moved away from those type of technology certifications and went down all of the cyber framework stuff with CSSP and all that stuff. And, you know, again, now we talk about machine learning, which you recently mm -hmm. uh, asked with, AW, with, with Amazon AWS. And I think that what I'm seeing now is that a lot of organizations are building something. They're looking to AI and machine learning to, you know, help grow their business, to get good insights. You know, I, I've, I've spoken to a med tech companies that are using AI and log analytics to actually give better diagnostics. I've spoken to uh, financial services providers who are using fintech technology to get better insights to help accountants make smart decisions. This is just, you know, the stuff I've spoken about. You must have spoken to so many. The reality is, I know I need to learn this stuff now, so I'm going to go and learn it. Yeah, I think um, for me, it, it did change a lot. I know at the beginning of my career, I did tend to focus on certain certification paths. Um, for me, it, it was maybe not for the reason that people think, but because I knew what it was in front, I knew what the structure was like. So um, some of the, the first uh, exams that I did were the Cisco exams, so starting at um, CCENT, and then I worked all the way up to um, CCNP, and I did CCNP security as well. So I, I definitely worked up that path of kind of like collecting at each level. Um, and uh, I did that with um, CompTIA as well. So A plus, Net plus, Sec plus, Pentest plus, Cloud plus, whatever else I've got in that, in that for, for that collection. But I definitely kind of went along the, the journey. Um, at the start of my career, I definitely found that helped because you know less of the industry and you know less of, you know, um, being self-directed can be a, a little bit harder. Um, even even in the pen testing space, you know, I did um, the Crest routes, I did um, CPSA wasn't a thing when I started, but, but CRT and then um, CCT. So originally I definitely did go up the paths. Um, but now these days I'm, I'm just happy to, to pick whatever I need at, at that time. So, um, you know, for, for the AWS certifications, um, I haven't followed their path. Um, I just did the AWS machine learning specialty. Um, I have got the client practitioner as well, but that that's a foundation certification. So I kind of <laughs> grabbed it on route because I could. Um, I think I will go in. And, and for me, the, the work that I'm doing at the moment, it's, it's quite likely that um, the DevOps uh, associate type exam is going to be um, a good one for me. But yeah, at the later stage of my career, I haven't been following those paths. I do tend now to just pick and choose what I, what I need at the moment. Um, but I think that is coming from the fact that I know much more about the industry. I know much more about the, the work. I've been doing this for 15 years. Um, so picking and choosing is much easier. But I think for, for those who are breaking into the industry, there's absolutely no problem with picking a track and following it through from beginner to intermediate to expert because it gives you that direction. Yeah, definitely. And I think with the AWS particularly is a really good example because they have that option, right? If you have a the associate level architect qualification yeah. like I have, then you just sit any different one, maintain your additional one and gain a new certification too, rather than, than uh, just sit the same. For example, I was working at the airport. We mm -hmm. did a lot with AWS. That's where I decided I'm going to sit this exam because I was working on it at the time, uh, and I did so. And then I've worked a lot in Azure since, and as far as the technology element goes with my, my previous employers. So the thing the scenario was, I was thinking at renewal time, I'll probably sit the same one because yeah. it's fresh. I personally use AWS a lot. I haven't had the exposure on so many other new elements of the past few years. But then I saw your post about machine learning, and I'm also had my mindset yeah. thinking about, I need to know so much more about this area. and. I so I so, so my mind is almost practically swayed to try and focus on just on another one. Yeah. And you know I may not be ready. I'll see as I collect and decide how I study. But you know um, if not, but I definitely will another time if I don't do it now. Yeah, I think um, for me the the difference that is trying to get across there is when between you know breaking into the industry where you're looking for the for the path to help you get the first job and and the difference now with with just doing the specialty exam is the fact that i use aws every single day i use it as part of my my role so i don't feel like i need that track to get me into the the field into that area because i'm already working there and i have the benefit of of on the job training um so i think that that was the, the difference there um that's a good sorry that, that's a good point because in reality, if somebody's entering an industry and they want to progress their career for reasons of climbing perhaps a you know uh, a rank ladder and things like that, limit ladder, 
then to go and do one AWS one and do another AWS one as far as the track goes may not be the biggest advantage for them. They may be better off going and doing an AWS one than a, a, an open group architecture one like TOGAF and then you know something project management related. So they've showed they've got the technology, the architecture, and then the project management. And it, it's like what you say, you know, it depends what you're trying to do again. And people's first focus before they even pick up my book or, or any technology is to realize what do they want? And given it can change, but what do they want is important, right? Yeah, what is, what is the goal? Are you just trying to pass the exam? Are you trying to get a learning journey? Are you trying to advance in your career? Are you looking for a confidence boost? Has your employer told you you need it? The, I think absolutely that the reason behind why doing the certification is going to um, definitely adjust which ones you should do and, and how you should approach it. Fantastic. So that is everything that I had taken uh, notes on. Is there any last minute um, details you want to throw out before we close out? No, really great conversation. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Sawan, thank you for coming on. And uh, we'll leave a link to Sawan's book in the show notes. So if you want to uh, catch that, check the description. And uh, yeah, more episodes to follow soon. Thank you for having me. Bye, everyone.